should do something about it. Solve. Okay, I think we're going to start. So we're delighted to have Federico talk. Uh, there will be a reception right after outside, so please stay and chat with everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so this is joint work with Antonio Mirales and uh, Jun Sang. Uh, Antonio is from um, Antonio and also Messina in Sicily. Uh, and during from Nanjing Audit, uh, who also had two representatives on Fujito's paper. So very well represented. Today, here, here they are, Antonio and Jun. So I want to talk about the problem of discrete allocation. There will be a set of agents, um, and there will be a set of goods, and we're going to assign the goods to the agents, the goods are going to be um, indivisible. Um, and, uh, the exercise will be to try to understand how to do this uh, in a way that is fair, uh, in a model in which there are endowments. So these agents are going to start out with some sort of property rights or endowments over these goods. Um, why endowments? Well, endowments, I think, are relevant for any kind of allocation problem where we don't start from scratch. Well, imagine we're going to uh, reallocate, uh, so we enter a situation, we're going to you know, do some market assign with some objective, uh, but you know, people have already, um, there, already, there already are people in this uh, environment, and so you know, to get them to buy into the market assign, we need to you know, guarantee that they are not going to be uh, worse off by the, by the situation. So you think about, uh, so next week we're going to reallocate the offices here in Simons. Uh, we all already have offices here. You know, maybe we like the ones we have. We don't want to uh, end up something worse. Um, but we, we might be willing to, to change. Uh, you know, maybe one of us likes to be closer to the, uh, where the coffee is. Maybe others like to be closer um, to the bathroom or to the exit or the bike store. Someone wants the corner office uh, in this cylindrical building. Um, uh, the, the other, the other uh, pitch I want to make is for school choice. So school choice, uh, as you know, I'm sure everyone here knows, is usually model. Uh, where the school's uh, pr uh, property rights uh, are captured by, by, by school priorities. And I claim that uh, this is not necessarily the way you want to do things. So as property rights, priorities are equivocal and they're not transparent. Uh, because, you know, just because you have a high priority in a particular school uh, doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to get into that school. Yeah, that depends on the details of the whole market. It depends on what uh, everyone else's priorities are, and it depends on what everyone else does. Uh, so, in, in that sense, uh, priorities as a way of ensuring property rights is not a, um, necessarily the, the best model. Uh, endowments are a very explicit property rights. So, I can endow you with a seat at a neighborhood school, I can endow you with a seat at a school where your sibling goes, or um, uh, if you have some diversity uh, objectives, you can endow everyone with a chance of going to the very best schools. Uh, so, so it's very easy and very transparent to capture these things with, with um, endowments. So anyway, you, you don't need to be convinced by this to, uh, uh, you know, to, to for the results in, in our paper. But it's, uh, I think, one reason why, why we might uh, want to think about endowments uh, in these types of problems. Uh, so what do we do in this paper? Well. Uh, dealing with endowments um, creates interesting um, conceptual and technical issues. Uh, uh, conceptual issues because they make agents unequal, and that creates a conflict between no envy and property rights. Let me explain what I mean. So if you have equal agents, it's easy to be fair, right? So it's easy to understand how to treat. Huh? They want the same thing, you flip a coin. But what about unequal agents? Uh, it is generally impossible to be fair to unequal agents without violating property rights. Imagine someone here has the corner office, right? And, and we all want the corner office. And the fair thing to do would be to flip a coin or many coins to see who gets the corner office. Uh, but that necessarily 
uh, in, in, involves making the current owner of the uh, corner office uh, worse off. Um, so, so, so generally speaking, just applying no, uh, no envy as our notion of fairness is going to be problematic when there are doubts. So how can you be fair when agents are unequally endowed? Uh, that's, that's, in a sense, the, the point of this paper. So uh, a little bit more in detail, if I give you, give, give you the models, so we're going to propose a notion of fairness for unequally endowed agents to prove that it can be achieved together with efficiency and individual rationality. By the way, this is another reason to like this model over the standard school choice model, because in the standard school choice model, there's a conflict between efficiency and fairness. There will not be, uh, there will not be such a conflict here. You will be able to uh, achieve both efficiency and fairness. Uh, moreover, you can uh, obtain our outcome as a market outcome. And, uh, as I'll explain uh, how, it will be uh, related to Hill and Seckhauser type of um, ideas. And moreover, you can achieve this uh, in a, f a framework which is along the lines of what Fujito was suggesting in his uh, paper, where you have constraints. So you, you, you may want to assign, uh, impose some constraints on the assignment problem uh, to satisfy some policy objectives. And I'm going to show you that uh, with fairly general constraints can be accommodated in this setting. Uh, all right. I'm going to skip the literature, just very quickly mention the notion of fairness I'm going to give you uh, has already, not, not the same, but the same spirit has been proposed by uh, Yilmaz, uh, but he uses it in a, in a different model. And the results uh, are not connected. Uh, anyway, um, so fairness, the, the other thing I want to say before I write down the model is I'm going to use uh, fractional assignments because that's the only way you can talk about fairness. Okay. If, if you can't flip a coin, then you can't think it's stuff. So here's the model. There will be a set of agents, I and agents, set of objects, S, with L objects. A lottery is going to be an, ele an element of this set. So this is everything that is below the simplex. So all the vectors in RL plus, which add up to less than one. The idea implicit in this definition is that there are really L plus one objects. There's one additional object, which is like the outside option. So if we don't get an object, we get that. And whenever this sum is less than one, then the, 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 co the complement uh, is, the, um, is the probability of getting this outside uh, object. Each agent will have a utility function, which I can assume throughout is continuous and monotone, uh, that assign a utility number to each lottery. And um, I'm going to impose some assumptions on you later on, but for now, it's a Think of this as a, any functions continuous and monotone. Again, the implicit assumption here in monotonicity is that the outside option is the worst thing that is. Okay, when I say monotonicity, you, you, you want one of these goods. Okay? Which one you want? Well, that depends. But, but you like these goods more than the outside option. Okay? That's the model. Any questions? So you may have risk aversion. Sorry? You can have risk conversion. Yes. yes. You, you, so the, the, this preference, so one assumption I'm going to use is quasi concavity. So that, that's something like that. An allocation will be an assignment of a lottery to each agent so that when I add up for each agent over all the object, it has some capacity, reaches some capacity Q. But actually, I'm just going to work with a capacity of one. And this is without loss of generality, because you can just include many copies of the same object. OK? So it, and and you, you can't be indifferent here. There, there, there won't be an assumption about strict preferences. So uh, you can just have as many copies as you want. So think of each object as, being, as existing as in a supply of one. OK, so that's an allocation. An allocation is simply a specification of a lottery for each agent, uh, such, such that we, we exhaust uh, all the capacity. What's envy? Well, envy uh, is that in an, in an assignment, uh, in an allocation x, um, I envies j if uh, I will be better off getting what j got. Standard envy. Uh, no envy is very easy to get. Just give everyone an equal chance of everything. But of course, it's possible that one likes uh, you know, more of what two has, and two likes more of what one has, and so we would like to you know, this, this is the chances for mutually beneficial trades, and we want to allow for those things. So we want to allow for 
those things to the extent that we exhaust all the possible gains from trade. So what we want is a Pareto optimal allocation. Allocation is Pareto optimal if there is no other allocation Y, which is at least as good for every agent and strictly better for uh, some agent. Okay, the usual definition of Pareto optimality. Okay, so efficiency and Pareto optimality. Can we obtain it? Yes, we can. It's an old result by Hill and Seckhauser, which says that there is a Pareto optimal MV free allocation and it's a market equivalent allocation. So I will give you a precise statement of this theorem in two slides. But I will to, uh, pique your interest. So here's the definition of equilibrium in Helen and Seckhauser. Uh, an equilibrium is a pair, an X and a P, in which X, this is what? X is a lottery for each agent, and P is a price for each object, such that uh, the sum of the X's equals a one, so it's an allocation. Okay. You can think of this as demand equals supply, or supply equals demand. And each XI has to solve the optimization problem for each agent, so they have to be buying the best thing that they can afford given that they're constrained to choosing a, something in the subsimplex, and that they are, they are given an income of one. Okay, they're given one dollar and they can't spend more than that. So income is independent of prices and, they, and there are no um, endowments in this model. There's no way of talking about endowments. Okay. So what I want you to, to realize, this is not, so I was talking, so, uh, so we, we, we usually talk about markets, this is what's called a pseudo market because it's not, this is not a closed model. So here the, the money comes from somewhere else. So you, you can set up this market if you're a market designer, but it's not, this is not a good mo a model of an economy. So it's, <coughs> a valuation model would not do this because it's a, But you can give like equal endowment that it is equivalent to this model, right? Yes, yes. So if, if, you, if you give everyone the same endowment, it will be like. All right. So, uh, Fairness uh, and efficiency can be achieved as long as we have some discipline on the utilities. You don't need this much, but certainly if the utilities are linear, then you can obtain the, both um, MV freeness and Pareto optimality through an uh, hidden sick house. All right. So let's imagine that we're going to try to build on this idea to allow for endowments. So. Now I'm going to augment the model by, by giving each agent an endowment. So what's an endowment? An endowment is an initial lottery that I give each agent. And notice here, I don't have a minus subindex here. So this is the actual simplex. So, so, so uh, the omegas, they add up to one. Yes. Before you proceed, uh, so you have uh, Pareto efficiency. You have NB free. You also have some kind of incentive compatibility because you have a large market. I'm, no, I'm not going to be talking about large markets today. So you don't want it set to compatibility? Uh, they want it, but, uh, <laughs> not, not today. T today. Today I'm not going to talk about it, no. But, uh, but yes, so these markets, in the large version of this uh, should satisfy some type of uh, approximate. Uh, yes. A clarification question. So are you requiring that everybody is assigned up to exactly one, uh, uh, and uh, there is no no, like unoccupied uh, object here, or? I'm not requiring that, but I will assume uh, that the number of objects and agents is the same. I see. So that will be true. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so there are, so you, you, you can write down, yeah, if you, this is not important for the result, but you just need to make sure that that you allow for excess supply if there are more objects. And, yeah. So when I write down a version of the equilibrium in which there is exact um, market clearing. Okay. And I so, mean, that, so that, 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 that so assumption is important for that. I, see. I understood for, for the purpose of today's talk, yes. Uh, yes. It's easy to expand, uh, generalize it to the case in which, let's say, you have some, some goods that are not owned by anybody, or is it, it's going to be very different? Uh, I have not thought about that. Yeah. That's, that's a good question. Yeah, I, um, I, I think you, if you're not owned by uh, someone, you, you could just share them equally and then repeat this okay. procedure. Okay. And yeah, the, the point I mentioned earlier, you can imagine the, the many things you can do uh, with the endowments. 
I think of So the model then is there are agents, there are objects. Each agent is described by a utility function and an endowment vector. And I'm going to start by um, uh, dealing out all the endowment. The aggregate endowment is going to be distributed among all the agents. OK, very good. So now, how do we build on Hill and Seckhauser to account for endowments? We want to ensure property rights. So we want to make sure that people's, you know, we can't give everyone now one dollar because, you know, uh, whoever got the corner office, right, is going to have this very valuable endowment. And now we put the endowment down to one dollar. Now this person might not be able to buy uh, the corner office. So to, to make sure that we preserve these property rights, we need to somehow capture the, the endowment. And there's a very classical um, way of doing this, which is well, rational equilibrium. Uh, so, operation equilibrium in this model is a pattern x and a p, where the x is allotted for each agent, the p is a non negative price vector, such so as supply equals demand. Now, the change is that you know, the, the supply has been distributed now among all the agents, but the aggregate supply is still the same. And each xi solves the problem of choosing a consumption bundle zi optimally, a lottery optimally, uh, that they can afford. And the, the change with Hiller and Seckhauser is that now the income is endogenous. It depends on prices. Okay. Sure. So if you post one, then Z I should be in delta or delta minus. Uh, it, for me, it's in delta minus. If you have equality there, doesn't that force? Yes, it, 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 it will force, yes. It, it, in, in the solution, this, this relaxation will. But the thing is, there are economies in which all the agent utility functions are expected utility, so they're linear, but have no relation equilibrium. Okay. And this observation is not new, it's, it's already in Hill and Seckhouse. So, so this won't uh, allow us to get started. Uh, now, I, if I have time, I saw, for how long do I go? Uh, yeah, 28. OK, then I would, let me just quickly show you the example, because if you haven't seen it, it's really worth seeing. It's an extremely simple example, very illustrative of what goes on. So what you need to understand is that budget sets are not the way we are used to thinking about them, right? So, so if you open up Muscular, Winston, and Green, you will see that you have an endowment, you have prices, you can afford everything in the green set. Why? Because you can sell your endowment at prices P, and you can buy it back. So you can certainly afford your endowment. And moreover, it, it exhausts your income. So the, the budget line must pass through the uh, endowment, and you can afford everything that's cheaper. Now, in addition, there is the simplex constraint. So really, your budget set becomes this set here. OK? So you look at this and say, well, that's not so bad. I mean, it's, it's a very nice. It's no longer. The, the budget system I'm used to, but it's still, you know, uh, convex and compact. I'm sure I can work with this. It turns out you can't. And, and here's, here's an example. Sorry, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Last picture. So, so this was your, uh, one was your line WI going through the PI, right? Yeah. And what's the other line? It's the simplex. Oh. The, your total allocation is at oh, the total. So this is the simplex, this is the sub-simplex, and in addition, you have the budget line. So, so this is what you can afford. Okay. So here's the example. So the example has three agents and two objects, but there are two copies of the second object. Okay? These are the utility functions that are linear. So if I get a probability 1 of object A, I get 10 if I'm agent 1. Same thing if I'm agent 2, but only 1 if I'm agent 3. If I get object B, or its copy, I get 1 if I'm agent 1, 1 if I'm um, agent 2, and 10 if I'm agent 3. And the endowments are uniform. So I'm 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. Okay? I just lump together the two copies of object B. Okay? If you look at this, 
uh, you think about it a little bit, there's an obvious way of um, assigning the objects here. The two copies of object B and agent 3 really likes an object B. So let's give one copy to this agent, and then let's split equally, 50-50 chance of getting object A between 1 and 2. And then the remaining 50-50 object B. So that's the obvious allocation. Right? Now let's try to support this as a well relation equilibrium. What will we need to do? Well, here's the simplex, and here's the obvious allocation. We want agents 1 and 2 to get the 50-50 allocation, 50-50 assignment. And we want um, the third agent to get a probability 1 of object B. The endowment is 1 third, 2 thirds. Right. So I, now I need to, I know what the location is. I need to come up with prices that, that support it. But do you see what the problem is? So no, no matter which prices I get, I, I need to get, I need, these guys need to buy this one. This guy needs to buy that one. No matter which prices I get, it's really the only price that's going to work is the one that has the same price for both, for both objects. But if I do that, then these guys are going to buy here. I will have excess demand for object A. So there's no way of uh, there's no way of um, uh, of and, and and so there are no relation equilibrium in this model, and uh, it's a particularly simple and striking example, which uh, I don't know why it's not in all the textbooks because it's really so. What is the equilibrium in the when there is a fixed income of one dollar? Sorry, because Highland and Jacob just showed that like uh, yeah. Income, because a, because um, when, when this very, yeah, yeah, very high level idea is... This is equivalent to that case, right? Because it's not equivalent to that case. No, because, because the prices here um, have, in this model, the prices don't have any nominal meaning. But the price in Hill and Sechhauser, they have nominal meaning. So here, the... the so the, the, the usual existence proof relies a lot on being able to make goods arbitrarily expensive so that you cannot buy them. And if you, and, and if, sorry, and, and if you make them arbitrarily cheap, people are going to buy a lot, lots of them. But because of the bound on the on consumption space, you can't get excess demand to blow up when you need to. So in this example, are the endowments equal? Yes. In this example, they are equal. Same thing. Yeah, it's it's not, not the same thing because because the prices in the um, in the hidden stack house the prices don't affect your income. No, no. I think you whatever you take the equilibrium from for the one dollar case, and then uh, scale the prices to like uh, whatever, like it's a three dollar, right? Scale the prices to be equal to the yeah. This this is an equilibrium in the hidden stack house model. With supported by prices two zero. Yeah, so what is the, so make them three zero. Where does it pass? Okay, I need so to take you, you, what you want is that the budget comes here. And for that, you need an, an exogenous nominal income. So if you have another good, which, real good, which is a uh, numerator, would you have an equilibrium like that? Something like that, yeah. You, you, you can do things like that, yeah. So, so we have another paper in which I, I give you just a little bit of, of nominal income in addition to this, and, and then you can get existence. Anyway, I don't want to pay, this is not my example. It's here in Sechhauser, and um, I'm happy to talk to you later about it. Anyway, not only do you get non-existence, the first welfare theorem fails. Um, there are Pareto ranked while reaching equilibrium. So, so many things go wrong. This so what do we do? So try to deal with this in, in, a, in a different way. Uh -huh. So here's the, just a very quick definitions. These are extremely standard definitions. So utility functions u are concave if they're concave, quasi-concave if they're quasi-concave, so upper contour sets or convex sets. Um, expected utility if they're linear, 
The only definition you might not have seen is the semi-strictly quasi-concave. And what that says is that if, if u of x is greater than u of z, then all along, along the line segment between x and z, um, it's, it's strictly okay. I don't want to say, I don't want to work with strictly quasi-concave, because then I rule out expected utility. The expected utility is semi-strictly quasi-concave. Uh, so more. the, the semi-strictly is if x is better than z, then any convex combination is also better than z. Um, all right, more standard definitions. x is weak parity optimal. It's just, there's no allocation y, which is strictly better for everyone. It's epsilon weak parity optimal. If there's no allocation, which is better by epsilon. OK. Nothing uh, still is there. Property rights. So uh, if you haven't thought much about property rights before, let me just mention what this means. Uh, in an allocation, x is acceptable to i if what i gets, it's not worse than i's endowment. So property right means that I have the right to consume my endowment. So you can't give me something that's worse for me than what I would get if I just consume my endowment. It's individually rational if it is acceptable to all the agents. Okay. okay, very good. Now, this is our um, definition of fairness. So this is how we accommodate um, fairness in the presence of um, endowment. So remember, I envies J at X if I would like to get what J got. Okay. Now, when are we going to... So, like, like I mentioned before, we won't be able to eliminate envy altogether. Because doing that will involve violating property rights. <coughs> so what we'll do is we'll try to eliminate envy to the extent that we don't violate property rights. Specifically, the definition that I will talk about today is that I envies J will sometimes be tolerated. And we tolerate it only if, in some sense, J's endowment is good enough. More specifically, if J regards XI as unacceptable. OK. So imagine I, so I'm the mechanism designer. Yes. I comes, complains to me, and says, look, you're being unfair. Why did you give J this? I would like to get what J got. So my reply to that would be, I'm sorry. If I were to give J what I got, what I gave you, then I would be violating J's property rights. OK? So think of the, of the swap between I and J as a remedy to envy. So this says that certain remedies are not viable. Which ones are not viable? The ones that, vi that involve violating J's property rights. OK? Now you might say, why do you only consider these pairwise swaps as um, remedies? I think they make sense. They're natural, you know. They're, they're, you, if you think of some sort of realistic complaint that you might do, it makes sense. It's the kind of idea in, in the school choice literature when you talk about justified envy. It's I envies J, and you get J's priority in the school. Um, but actually, the, the tools that we use can accommodate much more general sorts of remedies. So if you look at the paper, there are, if you want to come up with a more elaborate reassignment that satisfies I's envy, th there are many much more general uh, versions that you can do. And, and if you want, at the end of the talk, I can tell you more precisely. Yeah. Uh, can I ask about the fact that you're using J's preferences to determine whether I's envy is OK? Like, why is it? Because it's, because it's J's property rights. So I have to use J's property, J's preferences. Because the, the question about J's property rights is whether J likes XI as much as uh, his or her endowment. So, but they may not be the one who is assigned XJ. Sorry? Yeah, it is. Does it have to be this endowment? So XJ, person J may be assigned another office. Right? In the, in no, no, no. So at, at the allocation X, 
i and with j, meaning I would like, like to get what j got. But xj needs a endowment, so you may not violate the endowment. You know what I mean? No. Unacceptable. Like I, I, I have the corner office as my endowment. You give me the penthouse. Um, right. Katharina is, you know. Somebody else wants the penthouse. Yes, the yes. OK, yes. So you're, you're talking about non-pairwise swaps. So we, en we enlist. Uh, no, no, I, I, my endowment is the corner office. My uh, allocation is the penthouse. And you envy the penthouse. You, you would rather have the penthouse than whatever you got. Right? Mm -hmm. you yeah. And then you're telling me, yeah, but uh, he has the corner office. I'm like, what does the corner office have to do with me and the penthouse? <laughs> So, so I have something, and I'm, I'm talking about swapping what I have with the person and envy. So right. the, the relevant comp WJ. Sorry? Is XJ same as WJ? No. no. So what but is then why are we not Maybe. Oh, is that if you, you got a very small office. So if, if you do the swap, he will get, instead of the penthouse, the very small office, which is worse than the corner office. Which is, is it not? But it's not so, on this swap. So that, that's because, not uh, acceptable. Because if you have a swap, it was not very too efficient. So I think there is more than a swap. So yeah. I, will, I will get Pareto efficiency as well. So, so swaps that are mutually beneficial will not happen anyway. No. So if, if in the swap, um, you know, in, in, a, in a swap, you know, J would have to get something worse. Sure. So what is so, an acceptable? Maybe it would be more but, clear. But, I'm, but I'm, I'm not talking about mutually beneficial trades. I'm talking about whether the swap violates this other person's property rights. So uh, you could spell it out, right? It could yes. Say yes. UJ of XI is less than okay. UJ <laughs> of XI. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but if you have something that is not property rights, anything that doesn't benefit J. What does benefit mean? So, so J doesn't have property rights to XJ. J only has property rights to omega J. Anyway, so I didn't understand the example with the penthouse and the. Uh, so let, let's talk about it later, okay? But but you. I was gonna ask something different, which I, I think you're saying like. I'm not going to have an exogenous uh, notion for what is better or worse to determine what's for. I'm going to allow the agent's subjective utility to tell me what's better for them or not. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> there is an objective way of doing it with the equilibrium prices. We can talk about that. Anyway. Uh, all right. So the contrapositive I has justified envy towards J if I envies J and J could take what I got without violating J's property rights. OK? This we don't want. Okay. We want to rule out this kind of envy. Okay. Of course, this can be translated into a property of the location. In the allocation, there's no justified envy. There's no agent has justified envy. OK? Uh, forget about this. Uh, so now there, there are these. I want to do this quickly, but um, th there are these um, little technicality in the proof forces me to do some approximations. So that requires these twists on the notion of non-justified envy. So I has no strong justified envy. If I envies J, and J would strictly regard Xi as better than omega, and for epsilon positive, I has epsilon justified envy uh, towards J if I envy J, and the, um, uh, J likes Xi by uh, omega. So my epsilon justified envy implies no justified envy, which implies no strong justified envy. So here's the first theorem. Uh, if the utility functions are concave, then there exists an allocation that satisfies this property. It's epsilon individual rational, epsilon parity optimal has no epsilon justified. And taking the epsilons to zero, 
this one which is individual or rational, weak predicate optimal, it has no strong justified MP. Okay? Moreover, if the utility functions are expected utility, we can do a totally different kind. I will show you the proof of these two. Uh, of this, uh, at, at least the main idea behind it. Um, this is proven in a completely different way, but if the utility functions are expected utility, there's one which is IR Pareto optimal, okay, no, not weak Pareto optimal, which is, which is a big deal here, um, and has no strong justified ending. Okay, but that one requires uh, expected utility. Sorry, could you walk me through how this applies to the example you had before? Because that was an example of non-existence, and this is... That, that was an example of non-existence of world relation equilibrium. Right. So the location I show you will satisfy these properties in that, in that example. So in particular, it would pick out the one-half, one-half, yeah. zero-one allocations. Uh, okay. Um, the next main... Okay. The next, uh, the, the second result that we have that we really like is, um, is the following. So suppose you do the functions are quasi-concave and that the spade suit condition is satisfied. So give me a few minutes, I'll tell you what this is. I don't want you to pay attention to this. <laughs> so I'll tell you this in a, in a minute. It's just, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, you, you'll see. It's not complicated, but it's just annoying. Um, then there exist continuous functions, MI. So these continuous functions are income functions. Remember in the Walrasian model, income is endogenous. It depends on prices. And that's very important because I need to make sure that people get something that is at least as good as their endowment. So they have to be able to buy back their endowment. Right? So I, here I'm going to construct uh, these income functions, which are price-dependent incomes, uh, in such a way that I get the equilibrium condition, supply equals demand, x is Pareto optimal, individually rational, and has no justified envy. So it satisfies these desirable properties. And moreover, each agent is optimizing within the budgets. Where well, now the budgets are neither the Hill and Steckhauser budget, where everyone gets $1, nor the, the Walration budget, where you, the income you get is what you get from extending your endowment. But the income is specified by what the income function gives you. So, the, so the, the trick in this theorem is to construct these income functions that do this job. <coughs> and they have to do two, yeah, just a minute. They have to do two, well, three things. No? They, they have to ensure individual rationality. So I'm, I always, with the money I get from this income function, I can always buy something at least as good as my endowment. I always have enough money to be at least as well off as, as buying my endowment. It has to ensure no justified envy. So the construction is, you know, just something that ensures that. And if I have time, I'll, I'll show you what it is. Um, and moreover, it has to be such that you can prove existence with it. Yeah. What is the domain of this function, M? Uh, so for this result, we take the prices to lie in the simplex. So, it, but it should also care what my endowment is, right? Or uh, well, it does, yes. Okay. So, so you could, I'm, I'm fixing an economy here, but. It, I see, I see. Okay. But, but yes, it, it, it certainly depends on the on, on endowment, yeah. So does this mean that you need to know um, not only endowments, but preferences as well? Yes, Th this is a construction that's done for that. Yeah. So your notion of justified, I mean, kind of more reminds me of an of efficiency notions. It's just basically Pareto improving person. I'm wondering if no, it, there is a... it's not, though. Oh, we go swap. Um, I will, um, my envy will be justified if the other person is willing to take my allocation, right? No. Over your endowment. It's, it's not at all efficiency. So we will swap, but you will, you will get something worse than what you have now. But as then, long as it's not worse that, than, what your, than your endowment, then it's not justified. Can, can you explain the order in which you construct those? At what point you, can you construct those ends? Or in particular, why is this constructing the end different than just selecting the particular point that you want, like the endowment for you? Yeah, uh, yeah the, may, maybe the statement is not clear, but uh, yeah. So given the economy, I construct the ends. And then with the M's, I prove existence of an equilibrium that satisfies this. 
So how is this different from saying, given the economy, I create endowment for each for each individual? And what's on? Given the economy, I create, I find uh, XP and endowments. No, no, the the, the endowments are given. No, no, the, the endowments are given before. So, ju so I just wealth. Yeah. I convert the endowments to money. Like it, you generate an entire function, but like it seems like the definition is only using one point. Yeah. So why can't I just like define like this one point instead of entire function? It, it, I mean, first of all, it it is actually done in this way. Like I said, you you define the whole income function, and then you prove existence of equilibrium. And the equilibrium satisfies these properties. So to, to find the x and the p, you use the m's. Yes. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, finally, uh, so I want to make sure that I can tell you a little bit about. Um, so very, very quickly, uh, if you remember, for Hito's talk, there were constraints. Uh, for our model, you can take as primitive a set of allocations. So in, in, the, in the paper, we, we also derive the, the these constrained allocations from more primitive constraints. But, um, but you can take as primitive the, the set of allocations, uh, which is a convex and compact set. And it covers many examples that have been discussed in the literature. And you can just do all the definitions modulo the constraints. And you can prove the type of result I showed you before subject to constraints. So you get constraint efficiency. You get constraint. Um, uh, individual rationality, and there's no strong equal type justified MV, where equal type means that, you know, Fujito and I are of the same type, if we can always swap allocations without violating constraints. So, for example, if the constraints are anonymous, like in the geographical distribution constraint that Fujito mentioned earlier, then everyone is, is of the same type. Okay. Anyway, just a quick comment on constraint. So let me just very quickly tell you what the main idea behind the proof of this theorem is. So I think it's worth uh, mentioning. So the way in which we prove, is, uh, prove it is the following. So we look at, at a utilitarian um, maximization problem. Well, actually, this is not exactly how the proof works, because it's a little technical thing that I mentioned before. Uh, but the big, you know, the, the big idea is basically this one. Uh, so in, in the proof, we actually do an approximation of this. But, but, but think of it this way. So you, have, um, you solve this utilitarian maximization problem where you want to choose the weights on the utilities of the agents in a fair way. Okay? So to get a fair allocation, so, so this will guarantee efficiency. Or, or but this basically will guarantee efficiency. And then you want to be fair. So how are you fair? You choose fair welfare weights. You choose the lambdas here in a fair way. So how do you do it? Um, so you use the uh, KKM lemma. So let me tell you what it is. KKM lemma says, take the simplex. The simplex has, in this case, three vertices. Then you take three sets. One set for this vertex, one set for this vertex, one set for this vertex. These sets are a so-called KKM covering of the simplex if each one is, is closed. And for any point in the simplex, uh, that point, you can think of it as a probability distribution among these three vertices. So for any point in the simplex, look at the support then that point has to be included in one of the sets that corresponds to the support. So along this line, the support is this point and this point. So any point on this line must be either in the blue set or in the green set. On this line, either in the red set or in the green set. This line, either in the blue set or the red set. In the interior, they, they can be in any one of the points. Then KKM says there must exist one point which is in all three. OK? Now, this simplex is what I'm going to draw the lambdas from. So the blue set will be the set of all the points where agent number one doesn't envy anyone in a justified way. The green set where two doesn't envy anyone. The red set where three doesn't envy anyone. Look at this point. Here, we're giving all the weight to agent one. It would be very weird if agent one would envy someone. But all we care about is agent one. Look at anything here. I claim that it must be either in the blue set or in the green set. So it must be either the one doesn't envy anyone or two doesn't envy anyone. Now, 
they could envy each other. But if they envy each other, then you will get the Pareto, uh, then, then, then the efficiency would kick in. And because I'm maximizing this utilitarian objective, I could improve the utilitarian objective. So, so I, I, they, they can't be envying each other. So at least one of them must envy someone who receives zero weight in the corresponding lambda vector. But that's, again, very weird, because if all I care about are these two guys, and I don't care at all about this one, it's very strange if I, if I don't envy, uh, if, if I would envy that, that guy here. So, so you, you can prove that this, this cannot happen, OK? And, and the, the endowments really matter for this. So, so that's where the um, justified part comes but, but anyway, so this is the big idea. The, KK, the KKM lemma then delivers a lambda a welfare weight here in which no one envies anyone in a justifiable uh, way. OK, I'm done. Uh, the KKM lemma is a cousin of Sperner's lemma, and so it's a fixed point type of um, idea. It's not algorithmic. I'm sorry about that. Um, and uh, I'm going to leave you with the spade suit condition, which is a technical condition. Uh, it has economic meaning, but it's technical because I can give you another totally different uh, condition, which means something totally different for the economics of the problem, which also does the work. And it's there to bridge the gap between quasi-equilibrium and equilibrium. So it's something about the behavior of the um, income close to the boundary of the simplex. But, uh, so that's, that, that's why it's a technical issue. But, uh, anyway, that's it. Questions? The, the uh, epsilon sort of wiggle room in the proof does that come into play when you like by relaxing the uh, set you're optimizing over, or does that come into play elsewhere? No, the problem is that by allowing zeros here, uh, you, you're not guaranteed to get efficiency uh, be, because of the unit demand constraint. So, so you need to perturb this problem to guarantee that you get efficiency. And when you perturb it, then you take the perturbation to zero. That's where the epsilons come in. Yeah. So what, when you say the MIs are like a function, because in, in, in your definition, you only use MI of P, right? So why, why, why you say it's, it's a function if you only care about one component? Because the, the equilibrium comes in with the two things, like XP and M. No? So yeah, it's it's Wait, defined. Just a number. I mean, I give you uh, some money instead of n. What is n? What's the role of that function? I mean, you you could ask that. It, it's um so it's similar to Hill and Seghaus. And Hill and Seghaus ultimately, I just care about the allocation. I set up the pseudo market, then I get an equilibrium in the, in the pseudo market, and then I get an allocation. But ultimately, you implement the the allocation. The Hill and Seghaus is an artificial thing. So here, this is exactly the same thing, just that the income can't be $1. The income is this more complicated function of prices. And you let the market arrive at an, an, an equilibrium, and then you, you, you get the equation. But you don't need a so, function of P. I mean, uh, uh, with the definition, you say there exists P. And so it's only the MI is a P you have. But, but, I, that matters. I mean, uh, but I did use the M to find the P. Yes, yeah, sorry. More, yes. Did you say what the collapse condition is? It's Sorry? the spade club that, that is. Yeah. You want to see a condition? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think so, the point is just that it's a club in one spot and a spade in the other. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. <laughs> They're the same condition. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, it was, is that? You, you call a spade a spade. No? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I was curious. Uh, I find property rights a little bit of a contentious notion, and I'm curious to what extent it's important here that the in, like endowment or the property rights somehow like what what if I don't get to have full claim to anything ever like you know at some level some the society jointly owns some portion of everything is that. Is, it, is the application of Sperner's lemma somehow really requiring that my endowment 
is no, in the same it, space as my as the allocations. No, it, it becomes much easier in that case. Okay. Yeah, th this is only interesting if you care about endowments. Well, I mean, but there are many ways we can consider property, right? Like, it doesn't have to be that I own the corner office. I could own, like, some rights to the corner office, but not fully own the rights to the corner office. Yeah, I mean, the, the physical endowments are not important. What is important is how much utility are you guaranteed to get? How happy are you? Are you? So I, I'm guaranteeing you that you will be at least this happy. That's the yeah. Can I, the penthouse example, can I just complete it so that it yeah. makes sense? So um, you have the corner office, I have a very bad office, and there's the penthouse filled with somebody who doesn't care about the quality of the office, OK? And then somebody says, well, Federico just ran, I just decided he is cuter, so he's going to get the penthouse. And I say, oh, this is very unfair. And you say, well, he thinks that yours is worse than it, what he had initially. So that means your envy is not justified. And I'm saying, no, no. I just think uh, he should have. No, no, no. Office. So the condition is not that you, that is that. No, it, it, it's not. So the original owner of the penthouse. Yes. So, I, so the penthouse is my XI. The original owner of the, of the XI, um, assuming this is all deterministic, so if the, the original owner of the XI doesn't enter here. So if you envy me, the question is, would, would we be violating my property rights if I were to get what you got? But that's what I'm not so convinced of as a, as a notion of, so take this assignment I just told you, you get the penthouse. So I envy your penthouse. An alternative assignment would be you keep your corner office so it doesn't violate your, <coughs> and I get the penthouse. Yeah. And that doesn't violate anything. But then he will envy you. No, right. but the, I'm so just saying that the, like there is spot. an alternative thing. Yeah, this is not. Envy is justified in some sense because I get to say, why don't we randomly, why did you say Federico because he's cuter, throw a, a dice or something, and then maybe there's no envy anymore. You know what I mean? Like the counterfactual you're considering is only that you keep my assignment versus me keeping yours. And I'm saying, why don't you consider other, com why don't you allow me to envy you by me allowing to, to exchange not only between you and us and me, but across others, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, so, so that we can do. So actually, the, you, you can strengthen the notion of, uh, so you have I, you have J, you have K, let's say. Now suppose that I envies J, mm -hmm. okay? And we're gonna say, okay, we want, we want to give this to I, but, but what's J gonna do with, with, with J? Well, maybe we violate J's property rights if we give J uh, I's assignment. But now suppose we're gonna give J K and make him better off. As long as we don't violate K's, right. Uh, right. yeah, so, so this is, this. If you impose this instead, this theorem is, is true. Yes. Okay. Uh, so in fact, the, 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 we only have the proof of this in the, in the paper, and then it, it's easy to see that the, this theorem is correct. We are out of time, so maybe we can take it to the reception. Thank you.